Over to you, Charlie. So, folks, my name is Heidi Krantz, and I am a project coordinator with the New Farmer Project at UVM Extension. And I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar. Today's topic is ideas for enhancing sheep production. And we have with us Joe Emmenheiser, who is a UVM Extension livestock specialist. He comes from a family farm in Pennsylvania where he worked managing a number of sheep farms and butchering, doing genetic evaluation, teaching and judging. He's done a fair bit of research on using ultrasound for genetic improvement of lamb composition and on evaluating pasture-based beef systems. He has a nice presentation for us here today. I will ask that if you have questions, you write them into the chat room, and then Joe can address them. And then we'll also have time for some questions at the end of the session. So Joe, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thanks. Um, and I'll try to keep an eye on the, the chat box as well. If I happen to miss anything, just write it in all caps or something. Um, pretty big topic and uh, a lot to squeeze into a, a half hour. And not knowing the level of, uh, of participation we'd have here, there's going to be uh, you know, some information that's pretty basic for some people and some that's um, uh, pretty advanced for some of the new beginners. But hopefully just a cross section of, uh, of things to think about in, uh, in terms of the general topic. And so I think that the discussion has to start with the biology of the creature that we're dealing with. Um, and, and there's a couple main points that I think are pretty critical for sheep. Uh, their, their flocking instinct through gregariousness is pretty well uh, established and pretty well known. And I think understanding the fact that sheep like to be in groups and sheep work well in groups together uh, is pretty critical to managing them properly. Uh, their ruminants, which has some implications for their digestion, but also has implications for their utility and value to us, uh, where they have the ability to convert products that we can't utilize. Um, cellulose and lignin and other fibers into products that we can. And the products that they, they do provide are, are multifaceted or are diverse. And uh, a sheep can be used for meat, it can be used for wool, and a whole raft of other utilities. Uh, and then finally, sheep are seasonal breeders. They respond to decreasing day length. And, and so that seasonality stems out of their, uh, their origin and just the fact that their calendar is geared to, uh, to a natural grazing season or, or a natural uh, forest growth curve. But we have to understand uh, their seasonality and, and think about ways to overcome that sometimes when it relates to marketing. Uh, sheep were domesticated somewhere between 11,000 and 9,000 BC according to reports. Uh, Originally in Mesopotamia, which uh, kind of has an interesting history because it, at one time it was known as the Fertile Crescent. Um, and over time, increasing desertification and, um, and the ebbs and flows of, of cropping cycles and so forth, sheep were used uh, to offset those challenges in agriculture. And uh, the management systems that were used were very nomadic and very pastoral, and that kind of fits with, uh, with the species as a whole. And, and I think if we keep that in mind in terms of management systems, that helps as well. Uh, and then interestingly, um, the value of sheep grew to such a point that, that there were times in history when the wool market was uh, you know, the subject of competition for world power, much like uh, we view oil today. And uh, a lot of interesting historical accounts between the uh, Spanish Merino sheep and, uh, and England. And it's pretty baffling to think about how major sheep were in the world economy at one time. Uh, and, and that's just fascinating to me. Um, as, we, as we translate that to the U.S., uh, 
the U.S. over time has really transitioned to um, Excuse me. The U.S. sheep industry has really transitioned from wool production to lamb production uh, or meat production, and um, and it's in pretty dire straits in terms of of industry trends. Uh, if we look at it on an overall level or commodity basis, uh, the total number of sheep and lambs has, has decreased dramatically uh, over the last 70 years or so, and uh, and in addition to that decreasing supply, um, what's happening is that the market share is being used or, or being uh, absorbed by imported land, primarily from Australia and, uh, and, and New Zealand. And so there are some interesting pieces there uh, on a commodity level to think about. And yet, with this being a new farmer project webinar in Vermont, uh, most of the discussion today is going to focus on the Northeast. Uh, the Northeast is not without its challenges. Uh, we have a limited land base, which when we think about the, the nomadic pastoral sheep uh, can certainly be somewhat challenging. Uh, this isn't wide open space, and so there are uh, a lot of people here, which comes with expenses and regulations and other legal aspects. Uh, and then the biggest challenge in the Northeast potentially is the, the winter here and in the short growing season of the grasses. Uh, but the savings grace and the, the big opportunity for the Northeast, I think, is that being proximal to, to all these people, we have huge opportunities for markets as well. And, and so if we embrace those opportunities and realize that our greatest uh, potential lies in specialty niche marketing as opposed to the commodity marketing that's declining nationwide, um, I think there are a lot of seeds of optimism, to be honest. Uh, so where to start the discussion? I think every discussion like this needs to begin with the product. Uh, you know, what is it that, that you're producing? And as, as we mentioned, and I had some animations on this slide that uh, it hasn't come through, so we'll, we'll just go through in, uh, in chronological order. But uh, you know, meat, as you mentioned, is a primary product, but sheep also have the ability to produce fiber and whole grafted dairy products. The fact that sheep graze is a product in and of itself where sheep can be used for land management, uh, grazing neighbors' yards and whatnot. Um, farms that I've managed in the past, we've uh, leased sheep to herding dog trials. Uh, that became a source of revenue. Um, sheep farms are pretty well hefted to agritourism, which is a big industry here in the Northeast. And then even on the farm, uh, some people simply have sheep for the value of the lifestyle it provides them, and, and that's fine too. But define your product and start start there in, in developing the system. Um, instead of marketing what you produce, which seems to be the, the model many people take, uh, I, I encourage you to, to look at it the other way around and produce what, what you are able to sell. You know, what is desired? What is the price point that people desire to add? And can you produce it um, at a profit for that price point? Uh, and, and not only that, but is there a future? What is the sustainability of marketing that product? Um, a story in, from my past, when I re uh, managed a farm in central New York selling uh, hothouse lambs to New York City every week, um, $200 a plate white tabletop restaurants, uh, that price point was excellent. And that allowed me to produce at a profit, but that market is also very fickle. And, um, and because of that, I had to think carefully about supplementing that revenue stream with other diverse enterprises on the farm or other products that we brokered uh, to absorb some of the risk. Uh, and, and then at the bottom line of all this is define what quality means. Uh, I spent a lot of time in academia um, 
learning grading systems, live animal and meat evaluations, uh, the USDA quality and yield grades. And, and interestingly, when I left that the first time from Oklahoma State and, and went to New York, um, the marketing that I did and the definition of quality had absolutely nothing to do with, well, not absolutely nothing to do, but it did not align with the USDA quality grade. And so I had to learn different definitions and different priorities, and I think that that's a critical thing to think about in this case. Uh, so when we're looking at the product, there are a couple attributes that, that are important. Uh, probably one of the biggest ones is weight, uh, because weight has a lot to do with portion size of the product that comes from it, uh, but also a lot to do with the physiological maturity of, of the lamb. Uh, which is more manifested in fatness. And uh, so at what point in that animal's life is it, is it to be harvested? Uh, what degree of processing will be done? Are you selling whole carcasses? Like uh, I sold to New York with 26 to 30 pound baby lamb carcasses, or are they broken into wholesale or primal cuts, broken down to the retail level, or are they processed even farther than that with lamb hot dogs or sausages or, or other value-added products? And then, as I alluded to before, one of the most important pieces of this in especially marketing situation like we have is diversity uh, and having, having a home for every lamb that you produce oftentimes as and more important than uh, and having consistency across the board, which is necessary for a commodity market. And so transitioning from that product focus to the production system, uh, there's a couple of big point management considerations that, that I think are important. All right, go ahead. Um, so we're still brown out about a week, a week and a half. Um, it's possible that Bill muted his phone and muted his speakers. Can anybody else hear me? Okay. I think we're back on board. Uh, so interestingly, at the beginner level, uh, Flock House focuses a lot on diseases. And I managed a farm in New York with 2,200 ewes that they got to that point from 600 very quickly. And I learned very quickly about managing many different diseases that come from mixing animals at, at that scale. Um, but one thing that I've, that I've learned and, and I've, I've adopted as I talk to beginners is all the paranoia about diseases and, and health that you get up front really can be better addressed through genetics and grasslands or, or grassland management. Uh, just in terms of, of breeding and nutrition. And that takes some perspective to understand that vantage point, but uh, I'm going to focus mostly on genetics and grassland management through the rest of the talk here because it all relates back to flock health and all relates back to all the other things that are critically important and critical concerns in sheep. Uh, so we define this production system Again, everything feeds into the markets and the product that we're producing, uh, but the main points that I've outlined are the calendar that you're using for production, uh, the animals that will be part of the system, the forages that you're using, uh, which are defined by your management of, of them, uh, and then the resources that you have available from labor to finances to supplements to other things that are external to the system, all going back to making that product. The Cornell uh, star system 
is an interesting uh, image for the calendar here because I, I, the point I want to make is that this can be as complex as we want it to be or it can be as simple as we want it to be. She followed a, ca a calendar naturally. The Cornell star system uh, is, is what's called an accelerated lambing system where lambs are I you lambs five times in three years in theory. Uh, and so the, the interval is, is shortened to the point that that acceleration can happen. But it's all based around marketing. And the whole principle is to have lambs where they're at market weight available throughout the year. Um, and so when we define that, that marketing point and that marketing age, then we can back up from there to when do they need to be born, when do they need to be bred to do that, uh, how do they need to be grazed or, or managed to grow. And, and, and those are the, the main points that get focused. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the big one that factors into all this is what is our quality of life in that calendar? Do we get a chance to get breaks? Do we get a day off? Do we have enough? Uh, do we have enough opportunity to get away and clear our mind? Or are we in it all the time, 24-7, 365? Uh, because I know from experience that can wear you down. The next piece is the animals. And the idea that that animal is purposely bred for the function that you're using it, I think is the most important thing there is. Um, the purpose, again, is your market and your product. And so choosing an animal that can produce the product that you need to market on the resources that you have available is part of local adaptivity or adaptability. And there's a lot of mismatches, I think, in terms of matching a breed to a production system to a market. Uh, the two breeds that are pictured here, not to single any of them out, but we have an Icelandic ram. And then uh, on the complete other extreme, uh, a show type suffogram. Icelandic historically, because of the way they evolved, being very hardy, but being low in mature size. And so they're not capable of the growth to reach uh, some of the traditional commodity markets. However, they can. They certainly can carve out a specialty niche in particularly or in some particular environment. The, the selection for frame size in the show sheep or the stuff like this pictured uh, grew in theory out of, of trying to make an animal that was later maturing able to reach a heavier market weight with the same degree of fatness when cereal grain was cheap and, and, and so forth, I think in many cases that selection has been carried to an extreme such that, that that animal pictured there would certainly not thrive in a forage-based environment without all that additional supplementation. So think very carefully about what you're trying to do and what you're using it to do or, or what you're using to accomplish that. Uh, I didn't mean to bring these all in, in one slide, but again, we're, we're without animation. So uh, some basic principles of, of breeding and genetics that factor into applying that breed selection. At the top, a big one is the equation that phenotype is equal to genotype plus environment. Uh, what we see is a combination of nature and nurture. Um, and that genetic piece then can be broken into two other major categories. One is additive, which is passed from one generation to the next. And the other is gene combination value. If uh, we think about basic genetics, an animal gets or contributes only half of its genes to its offspring. And so half of its own genes come from its sire and half of its own genes come from its dam. And gene combination value is how those two pieces interact together. So heterosis or hybrid vigor is one of those gene combination values that certainly affects 
how an animal performs but isn't necessarily transferred to the next generation. And so then the next big piece in here to think about is heritability. Heritability is the portion of the additive genetic variance over the phenotypic variant. So how much of what you see is attributable to, to genes that are reliably passed from generation to generation to generation. And so this is this is the 30,000 foot view, uh, but looking at these major categorical traits, uh, in terms of economic importance, survival and reproduction are, are toward the top of the list. Uh, growth secondary and carcass and wool traits uh, are certainly important, but if they're not able to survive and reproduce, it doesn't much matter. Um, but their heritability in the second column follows the, the categories that are listed there. Survival reproduction traits are lowly heritable. Growth is moderate and carcass and wool traits are highly heritable, which means that with carcass and wool traits, for example, uh, selection based on visual appraisal is very reliable in terms of what an animal's offspring will look like. Whereas uh, selection for reproduction traits, for example, twinning, um, is effective but not nearly as effective as gene combinations and uh, environmental factors. So the application of this then is that the traits that are low in inheritability have a high response to heterosis. Heterosis comes from crossbreeding. And if we translate that into a breeding program, uh, when we're trying to improve lowly heritable traits, we have a much more powerful tool in crossbreeding than we do in selection. Uh, alongside that, uh, complementarity of the breeds that we use and matching, uh, matching the resources or, or matching the maternal breed to the terminal sire breed uh, in such a way that that they fit the purpose that they're asked to do, but they also work well together is critically important. And then when it comes to selection, um, measurability is the most important uh, genetic piece that we have. If we can't measure to see what we're going, what's going on, uh, we can't know that we're making progress. On the forage side, uh, which fits integrally into this whole process, uh, forage is a factor of the, of the growing season of an area, certainly something that I'm learning quickly as I transition from Virginia most recently to Vermont, um, climate and soils, and then the management of that forage to, to trick the availability throughout the year over what might be, be naturally occurring. As this relates to sheep, uh, the important piece is nutrition. And the, the big picture nutritional needs that we'll talk about are energy, or, or TDN, is total digestible nutrient, uh, protein, which is CP or crude protein, and mineral nutrition is, is, uh, is huge, particularly in this area, selenium is deficient. Uh, iodine and cobalt also are, are generally low. Uh, selenium is has major factor, a major contribution to reproduction, and if we have even a slight mineral imbalance, uh, we can lose quite a lot off of our lambing percentage. I learned that um, in New York and quickly adjusted the, the mineral uh, program accordingly. And then understanding how nutritional needs change with the production cycle and the productivity of the sheep um, is critical, and we're going to get into that a little bit here in the next slide. Um, finally, the importance of finishing lambs on forage. We hear a lot about grass-fed lamb, um, but finishing is not the same as growing. Uh, finishing a lamb requires some level of fat deposition, which requires a higher energy feed, and so having a system that provides the appropriate energy levels at the appropriate time uh, is, is huge. Uh, when we think about pasture or plant physiology and in terms of pasture management, 
I think everything begins with the soil, and soil testing is a critical, te critical test, a critical management tool. Start there and, and correct problems at the soil fertility level, and the grass and sheep and the product will respond accordingly. Um, other pieces are, are receding, and are you able to just use strategic grazing to mani manipulate the, uh, the forage profiles, or do you need to add seed uh, at some point to be able to overcome weediness or overcome uh, forages with low nutrition? Rotation is a critical tool. Uh, not only does rotation increase the output per land area per year, uh, because forage, when it's grazed and regrows, uh, has a boost in production. But it's also a critical piece in par parasite management for sheep, which is a huge problem. We could devote an entire webinar to. Um, but in, in this context, if we can rotate sheep through paddocks, more similar to how they how they did when they evolved in large open areas where they had to walk long distances between blades of grass, uh, we can minimize the parasite infections uh, and thus minimize our dependency on chemical deworming, which is now becoming less and less effective. Uh, clipping is a possible tool to, to stimulate regrowth, to get rid of, uh, of over mature material. Uh, if we look at the curve on the right here, uh, there's an antagonism between uh, antagonism between total dry matter available in a pasture and the quality of, of that pasture. So as forage gets more mature, uh, the lignin content increases, but the digestible, digestibility decreases. Uh, it's less palatable, it's higher in protein, or less palatable, lower in protein and lower in, in TDM. So we want to target our grazing in that phase two in the center where we can strike the balance between quality and quantity. Uh, and a point that just came in on the, the window here, uh, which is, is excellent, Bill, the need for fairly long rest periods between grazing to avoid parasitism, something that I've learned, uh, you know, again, coming from the south to the north, um, the hot, dry summers down there shorten that rest period, whereas uh, up here where it's cooler and moist and more conducive to parasite growth. Um, I grew up learning 30 days between rotations, in Virginia it was 45, now I'm hearing 60 here, and there's some, there's some uh, cases where it's really better just not to graze the same paddock twice in the same year if you can do that. Uh, but that feeds beautifully into the next point. Uh, because if we're not grazing the same paddock more than once in a year, we have the opportunity to produce more forage than we're using by grazing. And, and so haying is a critical, uh, certainly a critical need for the long winters that we have here, but can we graze and pull a hay crop off uh, in combination? And if we do that, and pull that hay off, do we disrupt the parasite cycle to the point that we can bring the sheep back into it later in the grazing season and still be okay from a parasite standpoint? Uh, final point on pasture management is fertilization. And uh, doesn't have to be chemical fertilizer that comes in a bag. Um, if we're buying hay into a system, we're certainly importing the nutrients to our farm. Um, and then as sheep move around from, from paddock to paddock, they do a pretty outstanding job of spreading this nicely pelletized fertilizer uh, throughout the paddock that they're in. And so thinking about how to use them to do that is, uh, has, has great value. Um, moving quickly through nutrition here, um, this table came from the sheep production handbook, which comes from ASI. There's a whole lot more numbers available than this. Uh, but what I'd like to draw your attention to first is that these are the nutrient requirements for 154 pound U, um, which is right in the average of the categories that they gave. And you can see with the uh, 
the columns that we have. Dry matter intake is the first. Uh, in pounds, total digestible nutrients or energy in the second. Uh, total digestible nutrients as a percentage of the feed in the, in the third column. Pounds of crude protein in the fourth and the percentage of crude protein in the fifth. Um, as that you go through her production cycle, we won't dig into this in, in great detail, but as she goes through her production cycle from maintenance to gestation to lactation, uh, her nutrient requirements increase proportionally. If it is heavier, she'll have higher nutrient requirements. If she's lighter, she'll have lower. And so, and, and then her level of production is also critically important where if she's on target for singles or more singles than twins, uh, requires less feed than if she's on target for mostly twins. If she's raising and milking twins, uh, she has a, a, new, or a dry matter requirement that's going to make twice what she would have during her maintenance period. Uh, and we notice in during lactation how high the crude protein requirements are. Uh, if we are off in the calendar year to the point that the quality of the forages has diminished by the time we're lactating or even in late gestation where the TDN requirement is high for twin bearing used to avoid pregnancy toxemia, uh, we can create a major train ramp unless we're supplementing the nutrients that aren't available naturally. Um, and supplementation gets a lot of negative press from the purists, but uh, the reality is that there are some things that just aren't available naturally, uh, minerals being one. Uh, certainly when there's two feet of snow, it's, it's challenging to have a grazing program. Um, and grain, even though it's a nasty G word for some people and, and is expensive for many production systems or cost prohibitive for many production systems, is more energy dense uh, than many of the forages that we have available. So there are strategic times when that can be important. However, the need for supplementation has to come from quantitative analysis. Uh, test your pasture forages, test your haze. Um, you can do sheep blood tests to determine if you have mineral deficiencies. And ultimately, all of these things will be manifested in the sheep's performance, but you need to diagnose the problem before um, you start throwing too many different supplements in and, and expect them to, uh, to be the miracle cure. A couple final points on meat product here. Uh, you know, matching the breed in the breeding program is important. And then certainly the resources to feed that animal, but we need to know when that animal is physiologically ready and will produce the optimal carcass. And on the right-hand side here, we've got growth curves of the different um, tissue types over time. Uh, honestly, I think that, that in many cases, fat uh, is not linear, and, and toward the right-hand side, we'll uh, will increase exponentially, but the reality is that we need to find the point in that growth curve before the fat deposition increases exponentially. Um, because on a percentage basis, that strongly affects the yield of that carcass when they go to market. And, and so if we have even if we have a carcass that's the appropriate weight, if it has a half inch of back fat to be able to, to get the appropriate carcass size, it might not be palatable or it might not be preferable or might not be profitable uh, for someone further down the chain. We need to understand how the animal changes and, and when the appropriate time is to market them. One of the most important tools to do that is the scale. And I don't see I don't see enough scales uh, in the Northeast in, in determining when animals are, are market ready. Uh, a lot of times, animals are marketed because it's starting to snow, or I'm out of grass, or I'm out of hay. And uh, I, I think that that's an area where we can focus on. 
understanding how to use your hands to evaluate the market readiness of an animal or the body condition of a ewe is pretty critical. Wool presents a challenge. Um, and so very quickly feeling the fat cover, um, subcutaneous fat over the transverse processes of the spine over out of the loin edge on the right hand side or at the top of the spine um, on the left. Uh, and, and we can go into great detail with that again. We'll do it in subsequent clinics, but uh, knowing where your animal is in its physiological growth curve is important. Uh, and these got overlapped a little bit, but uh, one tool that I've spent a great deal of time with is ultrasound, uh, which gives the opportunity to quantitatively measure some of these important carcass traits in live animals. Um, on the right hand side, we have uh, loin eye area outlined in red, back fat thickness in blue, and body wall thickness, which is farther down than the lower rib, in green. Uh, and not only does this allow us to assess market readiness, but more importantly, on the genetic improvement side, we can select live animals for their carcass traits without having to kill them because it becomes difficult for them to re reproduce after we do that. Um, and so ultimately, beyond animal evaluation is product evaluation. And if your customers are happy, you probably have produced a good product as long as you've been able to do it at a level that's profitable to you and that's sustainable to you. Um, and, and so remember at the end of the day that the customer is is the ultimate test, um, and, and I think that will guide you more than anything else I can say today. Um, final thoughts on shoe production here in the Northeast. There's huge opportunities, but you need to determine your purpose and your goals and match the animals um, with the resources that you have available with the products that you wish to produce. Uh, and if you do that, you will succeed. With that, I'm going to open it up to any questions. This has been recorded and will be available at the New Farmer website link, which is there. Uh, if you would, please go to the SurveyMonkey link below it and complete the survey. That feedback helps us to uh, develop our further programming. And, uh, and I also have included my own contact information down there on the right-hand side if you have any specific questions. A lot of this uh, is catered to individual production systems, and I'm, I'm more than happy to work with you. Uh, so with that, does anyone have any questions? If you do, you may type them in the comment box or chat window down there. It would seem that there are not any questions. So with that, I'd like to thank – oh, here we go. We have one from Johanna. I'm not sure my ewes get enough nutrients just before lambing. Yep, and uh, let me flip back to the nutrient requirement table for ewes. Um, but a couple things that, that will be important here are you know, what breed are you working with, what, uh, what's their approximate weight, uh, what type of lambing percentage are you expecting, do they have mostly twins, do they have mostly singles, um, and if you want to type, okay. Um, so Icelandic uh, generally will be on the lighter side than 154 pounds, um, and, and with twins, um, We're looking at the 180 to 225% uh, late gestation line here. Uh, again, understanding this is for 154 pound view. Um, but dry matter intake is a big one. And if that view is not consuming 
per, per dry matter requirement, the, the rest of the columns really don't matter. Um, keep in mind that the, the dry matter of the feed is, the dry matter content of the feed is not the same as the total weight of the feed. Uh, depending what you're feeding, there's a moisture factor that comes in there too. Uh, dry hay might, I mean, certainly in the 90s in terms of dry matter uh, percentage, uh, but wet haylages uh, are less than that. And if this isn't during the winter, um, grasses are very variable in their in their dry matter content. So uh, generally, with with grain available, nutrient densities are not a problem. Um, But again, the total diet is what matters here. And I've seen grain supplementation given to ewes uh, that are on very poor quality, uh, stemmy, overmature, first cut hay. And even with the grain supplementation, they're not able to meet their energy requirements. What's, what's critically important here is that, and, and Bill's point is also correct, that uh, some of the commercial sheep pellets are not very nutrient dense. Um, and, and so understanding uh, you know, the relationship between the nutrient content of the hay, the nutrient content of the grain, and how they fit together to meet the nutrient requirements of the U uh, is the equation. Um, the question is how much uh, grain to give the U per day. And unfortunately, there's not a magic answer there. Um, a lot of it depends on the quality of the hay that's being fed. And there are sheep that can get through late gestation and, and all through lactation without any grain supplementation at all. Um, however, they must have a source of, of high quality forage. So to give you the answer to your question, we would need to do a nutrient analysis on the hay that you're feeding compare that to the weight of your ewes and their requirement, uh, and then balance the, uh, the grain supplementation accordingly. And that's something I'm more than happy to, uh, to help you with on an individual basis. Can I talk here? <laughs> Can I talk here? That would be a lot easier. Yeah, um, one of my ewes loves um, that thing where they have a, a like a gloom smell to their breath. What is that called? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, she, I mean, she's old. I don't even think this year I want her to breed because she looks um, just really bad. But I want to know how to avoid that in my other ewes. Um, so it's probably a question of the hay, it sounds like. So well, um, I mean that the hay is 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 a possible contributor, but ewes become more susceptible uh, to pregnancy toxemia as they get older, um, and and so depending what else you have in your group, uh, you may not need to be as worried with the other use as you are with that one. Uh, the comment here is is about reading the sheep and. Uh, a very important tool that I've found in late gestation is body condition score. Um, you know, we want we want those used to be fat when they lamb, uh, so that while they're lactating and pulling that nutrition away to produce milk, um, they're taking away from extra energy stores instead of the energy that they require to survive. As, as far as the teeth go, um, I think she's got teeth. I, I guess I have to check that. She, she's very old, though. I know that she's got to be at eight or nine. She's very old, though. I know that she's got to be at eight or nine. Yep, yep, yep. And um, The first thing that I look at when I'm evaluating commercial use is their teeth, because if, if they're not able to uh, harvest forage effectively, uh, 
the whole rest of the system adjusts accordingly. Bill makes an excellent point uh, in terms of adjusting for waste, and and so dry matter intake is what actually goes into the sheep, and so what we put out in the feeder uh, might not all be consumed if the feeder is conducive to waste or if there's a lot of opportunity for the sheep to pick and choose through the forage. Um, and, and that can actually work both ways because, um, you know, the example we're giving now is that what the sheep is consuming might not be as good as, as what we're offering or certainly not as much. Uh, but in the pasture situation, if a sheep has more space and more opportunity to, to select, they will choose higher quality plants or plants that more uh, appropriately align with their needs as opposed to what we do when we forage test, which is clip a, a square and take the average. And I guess that... Um there's a, is there a certain period where I should be most concerned about uh, getting her the highest quality hay towards the end of the, of the uh, gestation? Yes. Yes, and I glazed over that, but the majority of fetal growth occurs in the last four to six weeks uh, of the gestation period. Uh, the gestation is somewhere just over 19 weeks, and so that last month is, is pretty critical. During gestation, energy uh, is usually the limiting factor. Uh, during lactation, we have a lot more potential to run into a protein problem, which uh, doesn't necessarily affect survival or body condition, but certainly affects the quality of the milk that the, the female is producing. And uh, certainly affects the quality of the milk that the female is producing, which is a major part of the diet for that growing lamb. And early in the lamb's growth curve, having a high protein diet is critical to its growth and its uh, muscular development. Early in its growth curve is the most efficient time. Uh, to deposit gain per pound of protein or per pound of, of energy. I have another question. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really understand like where the protein comes from where, versus where the energy comes from. Are they, is hay a better source or grain a better source or how does that work? Is hay a better source or grain a better source? Yep. Uh, okay, so, so grains are typically highest in TDN, um, you know, or very high in energy. Uh, protein, more often than not, comes from high-quality uh, legume forages, such as alfalfa or clover. Um, there are, there are uh, grain supplementations. Soy is one of the main ones uh, that's high in, in crude protein. Uh, in terms of grains, Corn is, is usually the standard energy source or TDN source. Others are compared to that. Uh, soy or soy meal is uh, the typical crude protein supplement to which others are compared. Um, but Bill, Bill made an excellent point here again that um, I'll just draw attention back to. And I made the point early in the, the seminar with respect to health about diseases and a lot of the things that are, that are uh, emphasized to new producers, um, but the reality is the most important thing, as she says, with late gestation or any of these management windows is making sure that the animal is in good health the rest of the year, uh, which means mitigating disease, mitigating parasitism, and keeping that body condition um, healthy, they certainly have a, I mean, they certainly have a, a flux of body condition that's normal, and at the end of lactation, we, we expect them to be thin. If, if they're not, they haven't done their job in making the milk that, that is needed to, uh, to help the lambs grow. Let's 
seem to be static here in the chat window. Anyone have any more questions? Okay, well, thank you for your participation. And uh, let me go back to the final slide here again. Uh, make sure that you go and complete the survey. That really helps us. My information is in the bottom corner. And uh, uh, let me know if I can help on a more individual basis. Thank you all very much for joining us on this. We'll be hosting another event the second Wednesday in November, and we're working on a schedule of topics. Thank you.